So, Paul, I see here in the show notes that you have danced with Mojang. Please tell me it came out all right. Ah, well, if you read the show notes carefully, you'll see that Leia's account was migrated uh, from Mojang to Microsoft. So, actually, Leia did. I, I was able to get through this whole process without ever interacting with any of the systems. Nice. I did get several worried calls. My, my kids are visiting uh, the grandparents right now, so they're, they're out of town. So I got several worried calls about like, Dad, I'm trying to migrate my account, but I don't know my password. And so, you know, like, here's your password. And then, you know, like, oh, I'm trying to migrate my account, but Microsoft is giving me trouble. I'm like, yeah, don't worry. Just push through it. You'll be fine. And then, like, she ended up creating her own Microsoft account. And then, like, validating her own parental consent by herself, which apparently you can do by yourself. <laughs> it's good these systems are watching out for our kids. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, all right, you know, go for it. And she's like, okay, I'm going to figure out how to do it. And then she's like, I did it. I was like, how did you? Wait, don't tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm glad it worked. Well... It gives me courage. Maybe I should maybe I should get around to doing my migration one of these weeks. Yeah, when all the old uh, Minecraft bug bites. Right. Um, speaking of email nonsense, what you should have told Leah is, um, I don't know your password. Nobody knows your password. That's your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so, there, so I made them email accounts on my server. And so I have, I just have access to all their passwords uh, and all their emails. Uh, it's Wait, kinda, you can it's actually nice. read, you can actually read their passwords. Yeah, because my email server, you cannot retrieve a password. You can only set it. Hmm. Yeah. I I use cPanel. Um. I don't know how widespread it is, but uh, same. It's same. Really I, nice. I also use cPanel. Yeah. It's interesting. No, interesting. Yeah. I, there is a way to to see the passwords. I think you just like click show password or something. Hmm. Well, anyway, speaking of email shenanigans, back in January, I, I was messing around with my email. I have um, several email accounts. I've got Seamus at SeamusYoung.com, which is like my public-facing email that's on my About page. And then we mm. have Diecast at SeamusYoung.com, and all of those go to a common address. But somehow, I broke the Seamus at SeamusYoung.com one. And so those emails were no longer getting forwarded to my central address. But they were still piling up? Yeah, they were piling up. So I had, what is that, March, April, so like four months of emails piled up there. <laughs> Mostly spam? Oh, oh, I mean, overwhelmingly spam. Okay, and here's the, here's the kicker. It was 46 megabytes of mostly spam like 46 megabytes of mail mail is not Man. that big but when i came when i i i have them sent to a common gmail address right i, I uh, sure and gmail handles all the spam filtering for me so by the time i got it those thousands and thousands and thousands of spam emails were trimmed down to just I think I only had to contend with maybe 50 real emails. Wow. So not too bad. The work of uh, an afternoon. Right, right. And I have not yet done that work. I hope to do that this weekend. So if you mailed me in the past few months, and I know several people have. I got several people wrote, read uh, Free Radical. I don't know what, what prompted that, but apparently there was a, a wave of people reading my book. Maybe that huh. has to do with... um. The System Shock remake that's coming out. Ah, could be. Um, I know, like, every month I get maybe, like, one or two downloads of the audio recording I did of Free Radical, and so it's... People are still engaging with it for whatever reason. I can't imagine why. It's, you know, it's garbage, honestly. <laughs> right. Do it way better these days with bigger names and better special effects. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so... If you emailed me in the past several months and I haven't gotten back to you, I apologize. It's on my to-do list. I hope to do it this weekend. Well, speaking of getting around to doing things, I was on a uh, a website. I guess I can say it is on HomeAdvisor. So it's like a 
like a home improvement helper site. It helps you connect with contractors and stuff. Okay. And so I was on there, I'm a, I'm a contractor, and so I was on there, like, managing my account. And so they, they send emails and send you notifications, and you want to, like, update things. And it seems like every time you click any button on that site, it takes you about five seconds for it to, like, do anything. Oh, yeah, I know sites like that, and it's always like, what? Is this site being hosted in 1997? Right. It's not like I don't have super great internet, but I've got like, you know, base 100, 80 at least down. So like there's no reason why it should be slow on that front. It's got to be on their server side. So I'm sitting here, you know, I click the button and I'm just sitting here waiting. And so I'm looking around the screen like what's going on here? And down in the bottom left corner, you know, where the, um, I use Firefox and it little, pops up a little thing saying like, you know, what requests it's sending out and like where the page status is and stuff. Yeah. And so I, I looked down there, I was like, sending requests to Facebook.com. And what? Oh, no. What is that? They have and a like, like every button. time I click a button, every time I click a button on anywhere on the thing, it, it just like hangs on sending a request to Facebook.com for, you know, four seconds or whatever. And then the page loads. So like, is that the whole bottleneck? I don't know. There's probably at the bottom of every page is a like us on Facebook prompt or something. I guess. Or just the Facebook tracker tags that, you know... Yeah, well, I know that they do, like, cross-promotion on a bunch of different sites. That's part of the what the service you pay for, is they, like, make advertisements for you everywhere on every platform. Um, so I, I can only guess that at some point they have, like, Facebook integration, and they've hooked it a little too deeply into the system, so anytime you want to do anything, it's like, oh, better tell Facebook about this. Oh, that's terrible. I wonder if blacklisting Facebook on your end would speed it up. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. Except that I, I do actually use Facebook occasionally. So win-win. That would solve two problems <laughs> right. for you. It would save me so much time. Well, speaking of spending time, what's uh, what's this Ollie Ollie world? All right. Ollie Ollie world. Um, the previous game, I played Ollie Ollie 2, and in fact... My oldest kid, Bay, was really into the game as well. We we had several afternoons where we sat at my computer and passed the controller back and forth. And it's a skateboarding game. Ollie Ollie 2 was a 2D skateboarding game. So you you know, you kind of just have this line that you ride down. Hmm. So it's not like an open world pro skater Tony Hawk kind of thing. It's more right, like a rail. Right. Yeah, runner. it's just a yeah, exactly. A rail runner. You it's just a downhill thing. Like sometimes there'd be the high track and the low track and you could choose between the two. And you mm. just do tricks and um I kind of hit the my personal skill ceiling before I got to the end of the game. There was some the final level was some I don't know like each zone of the the game was, you know, there's okay, the whole game was built as if you were skating on a movie set. So, like, there's the Old West movie set and the... I forget what they all were. Hmm. But just... So you're, like, skating on the background of all these movie sets, right? Um, sure. But the last one was some sort of future world, outer space stuff. And I, I couldn't get anywhere. I, I would just bail instantly. It was just impossible for me. <laughs> Well, there's, there's no gravity in space, Seamus. Um, Bay could get through the first several of those levels, and I don't think we ever saw the very end of the game. But then they came out with the sequel, and it is... I don't want to say it's... It's still the same 2D gameplay, but now they're doing it... Instead of with sprites, they're doing it with 3D models. Hmm. And they've added a story? The Ollie Ollie 2 didn't have a story. It was just... You are a skater. You are on skateboard. Go downhill. Don't bail. <laughs> and now this one, there's like the, there's five different characters that talk to you before and after every run, and they're all friends. And this they've they're all part of this skating community. And one of them is the great skater that's like retiring, and they're looking for this legendary skater of the gods for the next generation. And I'm like, 
This is just a skateboard game. We don't need a friggin' mythos. This is way Whoa. too much. This is way too much. It's it it made me laugh. It was so ridiculously unnecessary. Like, why did you put all this in the game? It's like having it's like having a story mode for Tetris or something, and all the you give names to all the pieces. There's the big L, <laughs> Wild J, <laughs> Mr. T, Inverted Z, and they've all got different personalities and they get in arguments before and after every level, and you're like, what 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 why? Why would you do this? It costs so much money and it adds nothing to the game. Wow. That's great. It's all it looks fantastic. Um, the characters have neat little voices. They use um, kind of like Animal Crossing, where they speak in this wobbly, non... You can't really understand it. It's just hints at hmm. their tone of voice and personality. So the big guy will speak like... Wah, 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 wah. And then the little person will be like... Da, 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 da. And it's like, okay, I get the idea. This is a little person. That's a big person. This person talks fast. This person's chill. It tells you about their personality. But again, like, I appreciate it. These are great looking models. Very charming. But why? Hey, at least they didn't have the skateboards talking, too. Oh, my gosh. They even added, I, I actually don't mind this as much as that you can design your own skater. The previous one, I think mm. it was just like this is the sprite for the skater. And you skate using the skater. And maybe you could change like the sprite colors or something, like palette swap. But yeah. Um, but now it's like, you know, what kind of haircut does your skateboarder have? And what kind of glasses do you wear? And, and um, a million different outfits. Oh my goodness, so many outfits. And again, why? <laughs> it's not bad, but it does seem extravagant unnecessarily embellished yeah so i see here you played a game called the captain i did and speaking of unnecessarily embellished things i have a design doc um that you know i mean i mean you and i both i think have piles of design docs of <laughs> yes. various stages of completement completeness right piled up but one of them is called The Captain, or Captain on the Bridge. Those were my two uh, titles for the game. But what is this, The Captain? It's, I'll bet it's not the one I imagine. I know, right? It, as it turns out, I too have a design doc called The Captain, but that's another story <laughs> for another day. Uh, yeah, this, The Captain, is a uh, adventure game. It's like a point-and-click adventure game, only it's set in space, and there are spaceship battles, and there's inventory, and uh, there's characters, and a bunch of conversations, and it's uh, it's charming. It's it's, it's pretty fun. Point-and-click adventure? Wow. There's something I haven't seen in a long, long time. <laughs> Combining things in inventory. I mean, it's similar to uh, the game we talked about last week, uh, Beautiful Devastation, in that it's a point-and-click adventure game. You pick things up, you rub them together in your inventory sometimes, that kind of stuff. Uh, one of the, the things I really appreciated about The Captain is that when you go on a mission, you're on a away mission or something, uh, your, inventory, your inventory gets reset every time you go back to your ship. And so anything that you can put in your ship's inventory just goes to the ship inventory. And then when you go on an away mission, you don't take anything with you. So it's kind of annoying because like, oh, maybe I'd really like to have something from the ship. But it's nice because then you have a very limited scope of the items you have to work with. You don't oh, have like right. 50 items from all 50 different zones and you're sorting through, okay, well, is this thing relevant? Is that thing relevant? It's, it's really pared down. So it keeps the scope nice. And then uh, I haven't yet run into, I haven't played a lot of the game, but I haven't yet run into a situation where the puzzle that you're trying to solve was like moon logic nonsense. It, it's all... Uh, but also, where it wasn't just, like, stupidly straightforward, it's like, oh, obviously I need to, like, take these ten things, the Towers of Hanoi, right, and, like, and move them over to these five posts in this order or something like that. It's always like, right. okay, you know, here's some items, and think about this for a second, and you'll see what you're supposed to do, and then you do the thing. And that's, that's pretty cool. Very nice. 
That's actually really nice. It's an interesting choice to keep your inventory limited because that does help. That makes it easier on you, but it makes it easier for you to brute force things. The, I'm yeah, stuck, true. so let me just rub this object on every single part of the scene and on every other thing in my inventory until something <laughs> yeah. happens. So you don't really solve the puzzle, you just blunder into the solution. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I did do that one time, there's like a space station and there's like robot bodies and you can swap between different robot bodies and you had to like do a thing and then there's like this machine and it like takes the head off of one of the robot bodies and so it's like, well, I'm gonna need that for a puzzle. And so I just did it, not right. knowing how I was gonna use it later. But, um, you know, it, it's not too bad. Uh, one of the things that I found was fascinating is that every quest, every like puzzle scenario that you enter into has at at least or maybe always uh, three outcomes that you can have uh, out of it. And so when you finish it, it's like you reach this outcome and you know activates or whatever. And then the next time you're playing through the game, when you encounter that situation, it'll be like, do you want to try to get a different outcome or do you just want to get the one you already got? And you can just skip the whole thing and get the one that you got before. So that's like awesome for replayability. Oh, interesting. So when I saw that uh, mechanic in the game, the, the whole theme of the game or whatever scenario is that you're racing back to Earth. And so you're trying to get to Earth in your spaceship. And uh, you can, on the star map, you can just be like, go to the Earth. Um, and like, you know, it's going to take you however long. And it's like, You'll get there before the time limit, and I'm like, okay, cool, I'm just gonna beat the game right now. Like, who needs all this puzzle stuff? Uh, but it turns out you can't quite do it that easily. There's, like, events that happen while you're traveling, and timed things, and oh, stuff right. changes, and things like that. Yeah, it's kind of the journey home, where, it, you know, the planet of the week type design. Yeah. That's yeah, you can, cool. except you can choose where you're going. You don't you're rarely interrupted. Like when I was traveling back, uh, just like from the very beginning of the game to basically the end game of the game, there's one gate in between that you have to go through. And so I was going to that gate and I got stopped twice, I think. Um, but they weren't like game ending stops. They were like, make some decisions and like, you know, something might happen. Actually, no, I think I was only stopped once. There were a number of cutscenes that I watched, but they didn't require me to do anything. So, yeah, so you're only stopped like mandatorily once, I think. And, uh, and that's pretty cool. I love this pixel art. I might get this game. This is really neat. Oh, yeah, the pixel oh, art is gorgeous. Oh, and it's published by uh, the Tomorrow Corporation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the World of Goo guys, right? And um, right. what, uh, humanity, what was the... Human resource machine and seven billion yeah. humans, and yeah, yeah, little and little inferno. That's kind of like their 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 one. I don't little know art game. B side. Yeah, their their one weird one is little inferno. It's one nobody remembers. Yeah, they they kind of uh, have a a very weird grotesque art style, but um, the pixel art, like I want to say, smooths that out. But that can't be right. Right? But I know what you mean. But this isn't this isn't made by Tomorrow Corporation. This is made by Sisiak Game. The, the captain is made by a different developer, but published by Tomorrow Corporation. Oh, interesting. Which makes a lot of sense to me. Once once you have published a game on Steam, you have an account, you know how it works, you kind of have all the yeah. inf infrastructure. It's very, it makes it very much easier to publish another game. Mm, yeah. if, I, if I were to do a game, this would be the first thing I'd want somebody else to handle. Is like, fine, can you do the Steam thing? In fact, when I teamed up with Arvind, this is exactly why. Oh, I was like, you do Steam integration and you handle uploading patches and, and achievements and all that. I don't want to deal with that. That's terrible. Uh huh. He was glad to do it, so it worked out. So yeah, the captain. Uh, the only gripe I have, uh, if it is one, is that the interface seems like it's a little bit too nested. Like you have to dive deep into menus to get information, and that should be on tooltips. Uh, you 
can't go anywhere unless you like go sit down in your captain's chair and then open up the computer console and then up and open up the navigation console from the computer console and then like click on the planet and then like confirm that you're going to go there so it's just like there's too many steps involved in everything um and i feel like if more of that was flattened out and you can't just tap your com badge and say data set a course for rise of seven and and you just stay there and tend forward Drinking right. hooch. Lying down in your king size bed. Right. You, you, like, Data, do I really need to come up to the bridge and push buttons to make this ship go somewhere? Am I not the captain? Are you not the helmsman? I, I think <laughs> our command structure makes it possible for me to arrange for us to be to go somewhere without me needing to stand next to you to make it happen. Right. There's even a communicator, like your little wristwatch communicator thing, and you can hail your ship. So, like, it seems like you should be able to just hail your ship and be like, take us to the next plot point. But no, they're like, Captain, we can't do anything until you come up here and come all the way to the bridge and press the red button that says go on it. Yeah. Nobody else is allowed to press that button. Only you. That's hard, you know? Pressing buttons is hard. That's like the first four years of officer school is how to press the big red button. Imagine how hard it must be to type in that universe. There's so many buttons. So I published a video recently um, about boomer shooters. Mm. And um, I think I've mentioned this before. The end credits are generated by a program I made in Unity. Yeah. And I just take the raw CSV that I download from Patreon and feed it into this program, and it figures out what reward tiers everybody are, or, you know, orders the names with the bigger contributors up front, sets all the font sizes and everything, right? And it just yes. generates the, that credit sequence for me, and I just record it like game footage. But it's not, there's like no interface on it. Like, I didn't make a UI, right? Because that's right. just... Because I'm the only one that uses it. So every time I do a video, I've got to tinker with this code a bit. Oh. In this most recent thing, I had... It had been nine months since I published a video. So technically, I had nine months of pent-up, like, Oh, you all these... You all all these people... Their name in the credits. And so some people were listed nine times. <laughs> <laughs> and I had some safeguards against that, but there was something about it that needed to be adjusted for it to work just right. So I had to go into the code and fix it up and make, you know, some adjustment for this new challenge. Right. And I realized I can't code. Um, I've, I've mentioned, uh, on, of course, you, you've read uh, the article I posted where I talked about my health and... Uh, I'm not sleeping very well. I can't. I can't sleep more than two hours at a time. Mm. So, um, and this isn't going to be. This isn't going to get better until I'm on dialysis. I've got a bunch of problems, and I, so I can't sleep for a long time, and I'm not getting good rest, and just my body's not working real great. And I did not realize how bad it was until I went to change this code. And you know, before you can write code, you have to read the code. So I'd read the uh -huh. code. And get it into my head, but then I'll be like, okay, I've got this in my head, but why? What was I about to do? <laughs> no. And then I'd be like, I have no idea. Why did I come here? Why did I come all this way? And then, you know, I just sort of go back to working on something else or alt tab. I need to break. I'm all frazzled now. And then I'll be like, oh, right. I need to add that for the thing. And then I've got to go back and kind of start over and read code again. And it sounds hilarious when I say it to you here. Like, it sounds obvious. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> but I was caught in this loop for like way more than an hour before I realized it. Like, always sort of reading the code for the first time and getting lost and forgetting what I was doing and then wandering off. And I was like, what? I've been sitting here a long time and it, it's almost time for another nap. I'm like falling asleep again and I haven't written any code. What's going on? And I finally realized that, you know, um, my brain no worky. Oh, 
Wow. It's so weird when you're in the middle of it too. Like you're not a, you're not conscious of how uh, how much degraded that your consciousness is, right? Right, right. I have no. I do not feel stupider. I don't feel like oh wow. I feel so dumb today. I feel totally normal. And it's not until I attempt to use my intellect that I realize it's not available. It's like not realizing how weak you are until you go to pick up your coffee cup and you realize it's incredibly heavy and you need to use both hands. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> that doesn't right. make any sense. This shouldn't be this hard. Yeah, I, I run into that sometimes. I get sleep deprived or whatever, and or I'm working late on a project. You know how it is. You're 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 like, oh, I'm making so much progress and oh, getting yeah, so much done. Yeah. And so you stay up till like 4 a.m. and you're like coding and it's like, man, I've run into a really tough problem here, but I'm going to keep working at it because I can do it. I'm make, being so productive. And then like you finally go to sleep and you get up the next day and you're like, this problem is not hard at all. My problem was I was up at 4 a.m. What was I thinking? Right, right. Oh, and I keep thinking of things I'd like to do coding. I, I don't know why I want to code right now. I don't even have anything specific. I'm just like, oh, it'd be cool to do this. It'd be cool to do this. But that's like, it's like deciding, oh man, now would be a great time to take up jogging. It's like, no, <laughs> it's a terrible time to do that. Maybe I'll just run a, a 10K. You're right. It's like, I am not in any condition. I barely got that stupid program working well enough to get oh, the video man. out the door. And oh. that's like easy mode. It is nice to have automation that just works though. I I did the same thing with the diecast yeah. videos. Um, I actually switched back from using DaVinci Resolve back to using Blender just because I know how to automate stuff in Blender and so I've got a script and I just like change the episode number paste in the timestamps, hit go, and it sets the whole thing up. It's like, this is awesome. Nice. Yeah. Incidentally, uh, for people that um, check out the YouTube version of this show, if you're just like, if it's um, Sunday night for you, and you're just jonesing for your next dose of diecast, you can probably catch it early on Paul's channel, because he posts it the night before, but I always have it go at 6 a.m. the next day. So that's there, that's your, been... that's your secret, that's your secret route in. <laughs> I've been streaming them a little bit early, so if you want to jump on, leave a comment or whatever. Yeah. Well, you're not up to coding, but maybe are you up to doing some mailbags? Let's do some mailbags. Dear Diecast, I hope you're doing well. Recently, I exposed, I was exposed to the joys of PC gaming to my five-year-old sister. Up until that point, she'd only played mobile games, and while there are some good ones out there, most of them are, well, mobile games. On the PC, we mostly play story games, but I know that she also likes watching Minecraft Let's Plays, which is why I want to show her how to play Minecraft. But I've never really played it myself, so I was wondering, which version of Minecraft should I get? The Java version or the Microsoft Store version? EJ, I know that the Java version is free and has all the mods. What is the Microsoft version got going for it? Take care, keep being awesome, Lino. Thank you, Lino. Uh, quick correction, I believe the Java version isn't free. Do they make it free at some right. point? Um, I, not to my knowledge. I, I believe it still is money cost. Yeah, I think it's like 20 bucks or something uh, for Java. I got it for... I got it... I, I said before that I paid 20 bucks for it. I realized I bought it early, like while it was still in alpha, so I got Minecraft for 15. So mm. that's like the... That's the best money I ever spent on a video. Like, I will never get more value <laughs> for any $15 that's that right. I spend. Like, thousands of hours of entertainment for $15. Yeah. I remember at one point they had, like, a bonus deal where you could buy four for, like, 20 bucks or something. I'm like, done! And I bought them and, like, gave out codes to everybody. Yeah. Wow, man, what a deal. But anyway, it's still it's still a steal at twenty bucks. I, I I wouldn't blink it at buying another copy if we needed one. Um, right. The Microsoft version is more performant, I believe. It is way more, okay. The difference is pretty stark. If you're used to the Java version, you fire it up and then it sort of slowly, um, you know, it builds the near terrain and that it generates 
the near terrain, then the middle terrain, then the far terrain, and then the really far terrain. It takes a while. If you just hold still, it takes a while for it to settle in and mm -hmm. finish generating. And even if it's generated, it takes a while to load in as well. Right. Um, none of that is a problem in, what's this version called? The Bedrock Edition, I think. Bedrock Edition. It's just, boom, you enter the world and whew, all the way out to the horizon. Huge draw distance. Looks amazing. Just very smooth performing. Um Okay. And this isn't just performant like, oh, the frame rate is good. I mean, you know, the the proc gen stuff is so fast. Well, even even now on my souped up supercomputer, if I'm on the Java edition and I like get in a boat and start sailing real fast, um, it'll have trouble keeping up. Like my frame rate will be good, but the terrain in front of me will be getting generated just as I get close to it. Um, right. You know, I, w I can't see all the way to the horizon unless I hold still for 10 or 15 seconds. Um, so the Bedrock Edition is much more performant, but the Bedrock Edition has no mods. So if you want to well, play with mods... it's it's got, like, content packs and stuff, which uh, can contain some scripts. Um, yeah. And my kids have spent more money than I would like to admit on... Minecraft Bedrock Edition content stuff just because I like I want to play with dinosaurs and I want to run a pet shop or whatever. It's like, okay, you know, like, it's your money. But uh, yeah, so, so so like if you're if you're really into the mods and the expanded functionality, Java Edition is the way to go. If you're imagining that you're going to be spending most of your time in vanilla, then go with Bedrock Edition probably. And there's always the option to do a little bit of content expansion with the, uh, with yeah. the store. Yeah, I could never give up Java Edition because I can't give up my... I never play vanilla Minecraft. I can't give up my shader packs either. Like, oh, I, you yeah. know, ray tracing and shadowing and bloom lighting and just turn up the color vibrance and it's just a crazy sparkle world. It just makes it me It seems so like that would be something that would be a no-brainer to add to the Bedrock Edition. They've already got the right? source all cracked open. I mean, and it's faster on top, so why don't they... I don't know. I don't know why they don't do that. Right. I don't know either. Dear DieCast, uh, this is another email from Nick now. We're going back. We're, we're kind of sprinkling him throughout because he <laughs> wrote us so many questions. Uh, I, have, I admit I have no comprehension of programming or operating system design, but despite this, I find it hard to comprehend why in the year 2020 or 2022, I still find myself in the same dumb situation I found myself during the 90s, where I would double-click an executable and then wait some arbitrary period from 5 to 30 seconds for any kind of response. During these fleeting seconds, my mind can play cruel games with my heart. Are you sure you double-click correctly? The computer and I might not have registered your input. Now you could be wasting time on a program that will never, ever start. But then, of course, if you double-click again, then you risk opening the same program twice simultaneously. Even if modern technology did still require such extensive startup times, couldn't there at least be some basic signal from Windows to tell you your computer is doing something at all? As I have no experience with Linux or Mac, do these problems, uh, platforms handle this problem any better? Yours inconsistently, Nick. Thank you, Nick. This is, yeah, wow, what a, what a rabbit hole. Uh, I guess, I mean, the, the go-to answer for this is John Blow's talk. Where he, yeah. <laughs> he talks about exactly this problem and he compares, what is it, Adobe Photoshop in the 90s with Adobe Photoshop yeah. now and how it still takes that same amount of time. It's even slower to start up. And the, the saying is, um, I forget who the Intel guy is, but one guy giveth, meaning he gives us faster processors and... Bill taketh away, meaning Bill Gates, has a slower version of Windows that will eat up any performance gains that these faster processors <laughs> give us. And I wish I could yeah, remember the name because yeah. it's a really pithy saying, but I can't remember I can't remember the names. But um and you can tell how old this saying is because it's still it's still talking about Bill Gates and he hasn't run Microsoft in twenty years. <laughs> right. Right. And it's still true. I believe this yeah. is true on all 
operating systems, although Linux is way better than the other two. Yeah, it really is. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things. Well, it's like we were talking earlier about the sending request to Facebook.com thing. It's like you get these really complicated systems and they all start talking to each other and it's really easy for it to get sidetracked and off into something that you don't care about but that it thinks is necessary and yeah, it just hangs itself up. In the abstract, the problem is that we use frameworks and to okay we build tools and then we use those tools to build even better more complicated tools and then we use those tools to build even more complicated tools um but each <laughs> right. level up each level up the tool becomes less specific and this more broad general monolithic this big system in is of it in and of itself um, I'm trying to think of an example that won't require 10 minutes of explanations. All right, like, um, somebody comes out with, a, you know, Windows comes out with uh, some new controls. Back in the old days, it was just buttons and scroll bars and, you know, the really simple elemental controls. But then, you know, Windows comes out and they add, like, uh, an image picker so it can show you a whole big scrolling list of images and you can click on them and and scroll up and down the list and select an image right right and it's a dialogue specifically designed for that and another one that's specifically designed for selecting colors and another one that's specifically designed for incredibly specific you know manipulating fonts or something and these controls are very complicated to interface with, and you don't need 90% of their features. So somebody else will make a, f a big old framework to wrap around all these basic Windows controls. They're like, use our, use our UI library. So you load hmm. in their UI library, and then it lets you use a few lines of code to generate these buttons, and a few lines of code to respond to the buttons. But what's happening is that there are thousands, of, you know, you've got that one line of code that's like handle button push. But behind that line of code is hundreds and hundreds of lines of code um, handling all the, all the subtleties of all the things this button could do. Yeah, um, and all the lines of code that it's interfacing with in the operating system handling how all the different things you could do with interfaces and then all of those right. things interfacing with all the hundreds and thousands of different drivers that are controlling all the hardware things and all the different kinds of hardware that might be involved and so it's like this super generalized system where it's like going out it's like taking a road trip to go get your mail right like you could just walk out the front door to the mailbox but like if everywhere you go you have to take all this stuff with you then you're like packing the car up just so you can drive around the corner to get your mail right and that's one line of code go get mail and you don't realize that you have caused you have caused the computer to pack a lunch an extra change of clothes a suitcase <laughs> right, right. put it in the trunk of your car and drive out to the mailbox get the mail come yeah. home unpack the suitcase put all the clothes right. away put the clothes yeah, well, in the drive laundry to the, drive to the gas station to top up the gas first right like you wouldn't right, just right. go to the mailbox right like whoever wrote this library wants to cover every possible use case. Oh, we don't want them to run out of gas. So every time you go to check the mail, you end up, you know, packing a suitcase, going out, topping off the gas. <laughs> Get the even oil if... changed. <laughs> right. And then when you come back, take all those clothes you packed and never wore and throw them in the laundry because they're <laughs> the assumption <laughs> is the laundry. That they're... <laughs> right, that they're dirty now because that's what you would do on it. And nobody notices this. You just see that one line of code and you don't realize this horrendous amount of work that's going on. So it saves tons of programmer time by wasting absolutely gargantuan amounts of processing time. And it's a trade off. I mean, if we didn't use some amount of toolkits and frameworks we would never get anything done well that's not entirely true right i mean like roller coaster tycoon was famously written in assembly I think. right <laughs> right um but that's a very that's a very intense way of doing things and the bigger mm. your project is the harder it is to to 
do something at that level. Mm. And right. I mean, I certainly wouldn't expect somebody to make Microsoft Office in Assembler. That would be I don't know. Outrageous. Isn't that isn't that less complicated than than Roller Coaster Tycoon? No. No, absolutely. When you get into when you get into the nitty gritty of font reading and positioning and placing text, um, that stuff gets. I mean, as somebody who's who's dabbled in just just a font reader, just a simple like I couldn't use a default font library, so I did a first pass of like what it takes to load a font, and it is. Um, well, you know what Doctor Strange opens up one of those portals to the mirror dimension and everything <laughs> turns bendy and crazy? And you realize, oh, uh -huh. this is more than I bargained for. I just I just wanted to check the mail, Stephen. <laughs> Why did you turn the universe inside out? That's kind of what it's like doing font loading. and pre If you want to do it properly. You know, because you suddenly bring in all the requirements of Unicode and handling special characters and right to left reading systems and top to bottom reading systems and writing systems oh, yeah, and yeah. all the Diacritics formatting. And... Oh, it just, you just like, oh, I'll just, I'll just do a little bit. Oh my gosh. And you've got, you know, years of <laughs> literally years of programmer work ahead of you. It's just monstrous, mm -hmm. and that's just for font. That's just what I understand with fonts. When you get into printing, there's a whole bunch of stuff you've got to deal with when it comes to color and um, image processing can get really hairy. Uh, and I'm sure there's a thousand other things I'm not thinking of, but yeah, yeah, we're like I understand why you say that. Like a word processor is in theory something you could totally write in assembler in fact that's a great project if you're learning assembler make a word processor but when you start talking about the microsoft office suite it is you know it's more desktop publishing than word processor word processor is like you know one twentieth of its features that's one of the reasons uh microsoft word is so infamously bloated everybody's like come on i just want to write a letter to grandma why does this thing have a control panel that looks like the space shuttle it's great desktop publishing is is really complicated like it can publish websites or books or a flyer or a poster it's just yeah, the the omni publishing platform. It's it's a lot. It gets complicated. Yeah, yeah, and that and that's not even involving like putting a, a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation inside a Word document that links to an Excel oh, spreadsheet, right. And, right? And all the script, and it can go into that. So yeah, I rescind my statement. That's that's a difficult problem. Dear Diecast, firstly, I hope you guys are doing well. Thank you. Have you seen Weird West by Devolver Digital? I was tempted to get it. But it is so outside my usual wheelhouse when it comes to games that I didn't know what to think. Jennifer Snow. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, I have been watching. I've seen several videos on it this week. I have not played it. I kind of... The consensus seems to be, wow, I love this crazy world. It's kind of, To me, it kind of looks like the original Fallout. Top-down, like quasi-isometric. Mm -hmm. But... The difference being this is real-time combat instead of turn-based. But, um, you know, you, you run around, you do quests, you run around the this weird west, um, and it's got, like, supernatural elements to it. It's not just the wild west. It, there's a reason it's called the weird west. It has tons of uh, very openly supernatural things, not like a dash of supernatural. This is like a... A full dose of yeah. supernatural, multiple kinds of supernatural stuff. Yeah, this is like post Cthulhu takes over the world levels of like occult and and uh, flesh abomination levels of weirdness. Right, and it sounds on paper like something I'd love, but every review I've I've read is like I loved the first few hours, and then it was kind of. Eh. It got like everybody complains that it gets samey and it's not nearly as clever as its own premise. Hmm. 
and it doesn't have as much choices as it feels like it should. Hmm. I uh, I actually bought and uh, installed a game and started up in the hopes that there would be a way for me to play through it without like being some sort of occultist. Uh, but it turns out no, that's like the premise of the game. Like you start off that way. So uh, I I refunded it. I'm not gonna. I've uh, I have personal objections to that kind of thing. So I, it might be a great game, might not. But uh, there's definitely a lot of like very. Um, uh, what demonic kind of things going on in that game? So be forewarned. Do you have time for one more? Oh yeah, let's do one more. Dear Diecast, TLDR: Many gamers have busy lives where they may be required to drop what they are doing at a moment's notice to do something else unexpected, e.g., parents of young children. Yet many games still seem to lack a reliable way of quickly saving and exiting a gameplay session. Not being able to pause or rewatch a critical cutscene can also be frustrating. Could this be considered as a quality of life oversight? Yours paternally, Nick. And there's quite a bit more that I didn't read, but he helpfully provided a, uh, a summary at the top. So there we go. I strongly agree. I mean, I, it's my job to play games for a living. And even I get like, there's always just, oh, it's the, it's the big cut scene at the end of the game. And oh, the phone's ringing. And I have to get, I have to get this phone. It could be something important. It could be something to do with my health. It could be my wife needs help, has a question. I don't want to let this roll over to voicemail, but I don't want to sit here and talk on the friggin phone during the final cutscene of the game or the big revelation when I finally find out who the bad guy is. And so I go, oh, oh, uh, here, escape. I just want to pause the cuts. Oh, Escape skipped the cutscene. Oh, I guess I'll just... Oh, and it auto-saved afterwards. Well, thank you. I guess I'll just play through the entire game again if I want to see what happened. Thanks for that, game. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. Terrible design. Um, or games that just like, well, this game could be online, so we'll just make it always online and you can't pause it. And it's very difficult for me to talk about this without engaging in just coarse profanity just continuously because it just is so aggravating something that the game the captain gets right is you hit escape it pauses the game instantly and it'll just wait for you however long you want and in the middle of anything that's the way it should be that's the way it has to be anything else is stupid anything else is just obnoxious i understand that it's hard to like you know, if you've got streaming video coming in and a cutscene with very particular timing and all this stuff and getting all this technology to work together and it's all running on the clock and it's hard to get everything synchronized and keep it going, but like, too bad. It needs to be able to pause. <laughs> right. You spend all this time working on, on getting this game to run at a particular frame rate, but like getting it to not run should be easy. Right? <laughs> Just whatever you're doing when the frame rate sucks, do a whole bunch of that when I hit pause. <laughs> Pretend it's a loading screen. You don't have any trouble making those. Oh, boy. Let's do one more. All right. Dear Diecast, do you think cover systems ruined shooters? Not to be dramatic, so feel free to interpret however severely you feel is appropriate. Or otherwise detracted from the storytelling and experience of a narrative-driven game. Kind regards, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Ruined is a strong word. Hmm, yeah. And, and it depends on what your frame of reference is. Like, cover was a very interesting mechanic, and it works very well. We'll put it this way. The, the classic 90s shooters were about mouse aiming and circle strafing. Two things that come absolutely naturally with mouse and keyboard, and two things that are absolutely, like, miserable to try and do with a DualShock controller. Mm. And, and so it's no mistake that as consoles took over, we came up with a new set of mechanics that were more fun to do with a DualShock controller, not so much fun to do with mouse and keyboard. I get very bored playing stop and pop. Um, you know, sit behind cover, pop out of cover, shoot a dude in the head, pop back down. And on mouse and keyboard, I find that to be 
not very challenging at all. I want to get out and run around. I want to put it. In fact, I sort of like, I find those games to be very difficult. I die all the time because I find myself just not wanting to use cover. Like, no, I want to just run out and shotgun these guys in the face. And the game is not balanced for that sort of behavior. <laughs> and you die quickly. <laughs> um, I died a lot in Mass Effect because I just like, no, I don't want to hide in cover until my health recovers. I want to fight. Right. Um, you just got to at some point. Right, you have to accept the premise of, like, that's what this combat system is. And so I don't want to say they ruined it. You could even say that cover-based mechanics saved shooters. They made them fun, uh, you know, for a different set of controls. Um, it was definitely harmful to the fun of PC shooters as I enjoyed them. But that was not long for this world anyway. Like, And if you don't have cover then you really can't have hit scan weapons so then the weapons have to be like slow projectiles right and then if you've got slow projectiles then it's all about your movement speed and so it really does kind of they're, they're like two different channels that you can go down with a, a shooter like if you've got hit scan weapons then you really have to have cover mechanics of some kind right and it doesn't always work like call of duty but the bad guys shoot bullets that that move at like the speed of an underhand pitch like, that's just silly. They shoot <laughs> giant glowing purple lasers at you that you can run around. That's just, that doesn't work for Call of Duty. It, it, it needs to have hit scan weapons, which means you need to have a cover system. There's no other way to do it. And yeah, if you're going to be out in the open, you need to be dodging projectiles, which means they need to be moving it dodgeball speeds and not bullet speeds and that means you need to be able to run fast which means you're you're embracing a high a a high speed cartoonish premise about you know like a guy that can run at motorcycle speeds and double yeah. jump again <laughs> that doesn't lend itself that does not lend itself to say gears of war or call of duty or modern warfare Although Titanfall made the case that you can kind of split the difference a bit. Yeah, yeah, they had some mobility mechanics and some cover mechanics, and, it, you know, they did a good job. It was a very well-executed game for what it was. Yeah, but, yeah, so I, I can't, I mean, I don't like cover-based games, but I don't think they're a scourge on the industry. I just think they were a natural evolution of shooters based on the controls that people were using and the types of games that were popular. The younger generation was really interested in military simulation, in realism. And I was never interested in realism. I always want to be, you know, a space marine or, or something ridiculous. Duke Nukem. <laughs> sure. It, it's kind of like fantasy games versus realistic games. Right. And cover is a pretty realistic thing. I mean, like, in in real modern gun-based warfare, you have to have cover or you're just going to die. It's, uh, it's a shadversity versus, like, D&D. &D. Like, <laughs> yeah, one, right, is, right. one is just really worried about the particular mechanics of how these weapons work, and the other one's really worried about making everything as fun as possible. And they're both worthwhile ways of approaching it, but... Um, if you're really attached to one, then you'll probably resent the other. And yeah, I do kind of resent the, how cover-based mechanics took over the industry, because that wasn't my jam. But I could not say that it ruined it. Very even-handed of you. The players, on the other hand... <laughs> Whoa! I think we better end there. Okay. Well, thanks so much for everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show... Our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye.